To sustain a career that spans over decades, you have to do it for more than just the money. Because over that period of time, there are going to be many ups and downs, moments of incredible elation and moments of prolonged anxiety. If you lose the spark that inspired you to do that thing you do, it becomes yet another obligation, another burden. Ken Merfeld has embraced and guarded that spark within himself for nearly 30 years as he's worked as a commercial and fine art photographer, as well as an educator. His process and his photographs are derived as much by his deeply held emotions as the medium and tools he uses. Rather than relying on the responses of others, he turns to those feelings and his willingness to be honest with himself to be the ultimate arbiter of his photography. Uh, Not so much about the response from people. Um, It's always been about the response from me when I look at work that's what got me involved in visuals um, I started looking at lots of photographs I started researching I started learning to feel when I looked at an image and tried to understand what ingredients went into making feelings feelings and work and that's what's always driven me um, that's why I go beyond the surface in my portraits. Um, I'm not about the surface or the superficial. Um, I'm about feeling, honest feeling, or twisted feeling, or broken feeling. But it's a feeling, not just the appearance. Though he regularly creates portraits using the wet plate collodion process, he is quick to use anything that is capable of recording an image. Because for him, it's the process of making the photographs and not the device itself that has allowed him to sustain his passion. I'm not a one-trick pony. Uh, I've been at this far too long. Um, I enjoy the process of, of creating of an emotional result. The camera really doesn't make any difference. Um, I've started with Polaroids, plastic cameras, uh, 4x5 in school, 8x10. I shoot now with 8x8 square glass and 14x14 square glass. And I shoot uh, with little digital point and shoots. And I shoot with my iPhone. Um, They all have different purposes. They all have different aesthetics. They all have different personality. And when you deal with them, Accordingly, instead of trying to make something other than it is, they're all fun. They're all interesting. We'll talk to Ken about what he had to learn to become an exceptional portrait photographer and why a wet plate collodion photograph produces a portrait unlike any other. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. I've always enjoyed looking at your, your work. And uh, this was the first time I, I did it, like a deep dive into all the work that you've, you've produced over the years. And I, I know that you've been working for, what is it now, 27, 30 years? Yeah, a little more than 30 years. 30 years now as a professional photographer, which mm-hmm. is great. It's quite the accomplishment for anybody to be doing something they love for that long. It has been a ride, but yeah, I'm fortunate in that sense to be able to put food on the table with a camera and yet be able to do fine art with it also. Yeah, and I know you have a real love for, for working with, with, you know, with film and working with traditional media. And I, I, I want to know about those, 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 the, the, the moment where you sort of fell in love with photography. Because I think when I think about people who are invested in film over a long period, even in the age of digital, uh, it's, it's, I think it's beyond sort of the aesthetics of the image that keeps them attached to it. I sometimes can't help but feel that there's sort of like a, a an emotional resonance that's tied with the process that it goes beyond what an image looks like. And I'm kind of wondering what that was for you early on. Well, first of all, you're dead on as far as an emotional connection being the foundation, I think, of anyone's passion for art or for, or for photography. How it started for me, um, I was quite naive back in the old days. I had a couple of college degrees that I decided that I did not want to pursue. So I dropped out and moved up to the mountains. 
this is Sun Valley, Idaho, back when Sun Valley was a little podunk cowboy town. And I was a quote unquote long hair. It was real interesting times. I lived in a little cabin and I moved up there to learn how to ski, to fly fish, mountain life a little bit, get away from city, get away from schools, and just try to figure out maybe what I wanted to do. A friend gave me a camera. I set up a little dark room in my cabin in the woods and I shot a roll of film and the first portrait that I did on that roll of film was my dog. And as much of a cliche as that sounds, uh, to this day I show that portrait whenever I do lectures or uh, classes or presentations because that photograph is the reason I'm here today. It's the reason I'm still shooting. It's the reason I teach. It's the reason I'm talking to you. I shot this photograph of my very special, very bonded to me dog that had a nose full of porcupine quills. Oh. And she came up to me with a nose full of quills and would not let me take them out. That's a whole other story and I won't go into it right now. But I picked up my camera and I did a quick face shot of her headshot. I went in and processed the roll of film. And to this day, I will never forget the feeling when I came out and sat on the steps of that back cabin with a tray full of water and a print of what that dog looked like with the porcupine quills coming out of her mouth and her eyes looking up to me. That print literally meant instantly more to me than the two college degrees that I had that I didn't know what to do with. And it flipped a light on inside of me that whatever that was about, I needed to pursue. And it was about photography. And so I pursued it. And it's a whole other long story of how I got down to Art Center, etc. But it basically started with a photo of a dog. I had the same experience. I was, um, I think I was 10, 10 years old. I was at a boys club. And I had the same experience of taking a shot, going into the dark room, seeing the image that I'd just seen through a camera reveal itself on a piece of white paper. And that was just magical. And, and I, for me, what, what sort of reinforced it was people's reactions to, to the photograph. Because I, I, I feel like photography gave me a, a voice. And I think that that, along with sort of the magical quality of, of making photographs, is something that really has, has sort of cemented my, my love for it. Did you experience something similar with respect to that, with, with, with how people responded to the pictures that you make? I'm still shouting, so I'm still finding a voice. Um, I think I do have a voice. I do have a purpose in photography, but I think it continues. It better continue to grow or change, or you're dead as an artist. Mm -hmm. If you ever think you've arrived as an artist, you are dead as an artist. So hopefully I'm continuing to move forward. For me, it was part of how people reacted to the photographs and how I felt like something that I created could create an emotional response in someone else. And I'm wondering whether the, the attraction to photography for you was also rooted in how you were able to communicate and elicit something from someone else. No, uh, not so much about the response from people. Um, it's always been about the response from me. Mm. When I look at work, that's what got me involved in visuals. Um, I started looking at lots of photographs. I started researching. I started learning to feel when I looked at an image and tried to understand what ingredients went into making feelings, yeah. feelings and work. And that's what's always driven me. That's why I go beyond the surface in my portraits. I'm not about the surface or the superficial. I'm about feeling, honest feeling, or twisted feeling, or broken feeling. But it's a feeling, not just the appearance. So what were some of the early images that you looked at that evoked those feelings in you? Well, I go way back to Julia Margaret Cameron and some of the, the early classics that were put on glass and tin. But I found the glass and tin process much later in my development. But early on, I saw portraits of Julia Margaret Camerons that blew me away. And I never knew till 15 or 20 years later, I never connected it to the process or what was going on. But I had a book 
about this lady and this lady who couldn't shoot anything in focus but the feeling of her images was remarkable you can feel a julia margaret cameron portrait from across the parking lot and that meant more to me that that challenge for that how do you do that uh, meant more to me than what someone looks like or if it's perfect or if it's in focus or if it's what the trend is or all that other stuff so so beyond the, the mechanics of how to use a camera how to process film you know you know the, the technical side of it what what did you feel you had to learn and, and teach yourself in order to be able to evoke that same thing in your own in your own photographs I had to learn how to see people and what they give and I had to learn to open up to feel what people give even when they don't want to give and that's the magic of photography you can open up doors that go inside of people even when they want those doors still shut and that kind of path into an emotional response is my interest or is my challenge the end result if it works for me um, as far as the experience I had with a person, if it's true to me or if it came out of whatever the exchange was and it's an honest or an interesting image, then to me that's a, a successful portrait. That's what I do. Did that come naturally to you? came after a long time, many years of shooting. Portraiture is complex. I first wanted to be a documentary photographer when I first started I wanted to be the next W Eugene Smith but I quickly learned that Life magazine Look magazine and all the vehicles for most of the documentary photography dried up just about the time I was getting into photography so as far as earning a living documentary wise um, it didn't look so promising and my mentality was not to be a war photographer so the choices seemed all of a sudden different for me so I gravitated toward people and just the exchange of people and the, the psychology of people. One of the interesting things that I, I read that you wrote was this idea of the, the, the photographer giving as much to the interaction between photographer and subject. That it's not just about planting someone in front of the camera and the photographer making the picture, that unless they are willing to give of themselves in that moment, that it becomes very difficult to elicit something special from a subject. What do you think were some of the challenges that you faced in terms of being open yourself and being generous? Because I think when it comes to portrait photography, you know, it's all about the photographer being controlled, in control. But in this case, it's, it's about you being in control of the, the you know the mechanics of making the picture but it is also involves a, a little bit of surrender on your part as well total surrender because i'm not really in control of the mechanics if you're speaking of the world of collodion right now um collodion is a, an imperfect process to begin with and when i began it i made more mistakes than humanly possible and what that did was totally kick me out of the world of perfection and and the years of being kind of an anal photographer it just changed me uh, all of a sudden i realized that wrong or broken or and i'd always realized they're broken or out, out, outside the the box or cross the edge or whatever you want to call it uh, that was always what interested me i was just wondering about you know the process of surrender and not and giving of yourself in your interaction with your subject in terms of how uh, how difficult was that for you to be able to to do early on at first early on when i i uh, shot film so it's a different exchange of energy it's a, a different vacuum that you operate within and i really learned the powers of observation of personal observation um, when you're when you're working with people over time and when they think they're quote on and when they're relaxed or in between rolls of film or whatever when the magic really happens so I started discovering all the other little ways that seem to be in the cracks or around the edges of how you were supposed to do things and then when I started colloding and I made all the mistakes and I looked at the images, and I liked the imperfection. I, I liked the feeling of soul and, and 
depth that it gave. It was a human quality to it instead of an antiseptic perfection mentality. So it was about imperfection. And I know I'm deviating just a little bit, but I'll get back to it. But the imperfection drove me to discover the Japanese belief in wabi-sabi, which is the belief in, in imperfection and that if something is perfect or good, mess it up and then put it into your work. If you find something that's already tainted or it's broken or it's not perfect, include it in your work. It probably is going to add soul. And it really does. At least to my work, it does. So I totally broke away from the world of perfection. And when I made mistakes in learning collodion, I embraced the mistakes. And to this day, every step of the process, which is very finicky, but I do with incorrect process, with incorrect direction, but I am giving it a direction so that I know I will get a result. I can't predict the result, but it gives me other than the expected, and it produces a chemical aura in and around much of my work that is unbelievable how it takes on the personality of the shoot. So I've learned to just believe in guiding toward almost a wrong path and allowing things to happen that enhance the visual. Now, getting back to the original question about surrendering, I learned all the details from shooting rolls and rolls and rolls of film and observing people. And I couldn't shoot collodion, which is a single capture, without all the years that I spent hammering away at how people stand, how they talk, how they touch themselves, uh, their hands to their face, when they get nervous, when they don't. With all the years of navigating through that, I figured out quite a few feelings about people. So when I put them in front of a camera now where I just have to press the button, I don't press a button, but you make one exposure, we have to get to a mutual place. We have to have an understanding of the world that we're going to share. And my world of sharing is not about presentation. It's not, I'm not asking somebody to give me a feeling of who they think they are or present a, present a facade, unless I'm doing something char in character or uh, has a different psychological reason. But uh, I'm asking for people to basically let go and let me in and trust me to see what happens. And the thing about collodion is it's long exposures, very long exposures. The effective ASA or ISO of collodion is 0.5. That's 0.5. That's not ASA 100 or 1,000 or 25,000 that you can shoot in digital these days. It's 0.5. That's slow. That means I'm dealing with long exposures. Most of my portraits um, range from 7 to 30 seconds. That's a long time. And people can, can depart the place that we need to be during that time period. And when they depart, it ruins, it, it sinks the photo, basically. And you can see that. You can feel it when it goes away. So there's a, a level of preparation. There's a little bit of a conversation. There's a little bit of sharing of emotion and feeling as we're starting to try to get to people to just really relax and be themselves and allow whatever their reality is really just to come to the surface or come close to the surface. And it's just a very interesting path and Collodium doing the, you know, being such, or having very long exposures to Collodium means that someone cannot fake who they are. Right. You can't dance around personality-wise. You can't all of a sudden be out of focus or half-cropped out of frame and, oh, there's your piece of art. No, you're either locked in and there or you're not. And if you're not, it's obvious it goes away really fast. And then there's the possibility of a deer in the headlights situation where you know people are afraid to blink over periods of time. And so that kills a photo, too. So you have to have an understanding about that part of the process. Blinking is okay. I mean, collodion blinking softens the eye just a little bit. But that's inherent to the process, okay? And believe it or not, softening an eye uh, opens up windows 
for more emotion than just a stare. So it actually works to my advantage a lot of the times. But it messes with people a little bit. So you have to you have to guide them. You have to get them to a place where they feel comfortable, they feel confident, and and they they open up. And the collodion chemistry adds this aura that I referred to and it has a it has a historical kind of a reference to her. It has a nostalgic feeling anyway. But if you rely on the chemistry to carry the emotion of the photo, no, you're not going to, that isn't going to work. You have to have the heart and soul of the, of the person. So when people see their heart and soul, when I bring out the piece of glass, and it's the one thing that's kind of nice, it's a double-edged sword because you have to process the plate right away when you shoot people, which means you have to leave them and go into the dark room and then come back with the result. So if you're continuing to shoot, that interruption of process is, is a problem, but that's also part of the challenge. But when you bring a plate back out to somebody and you show them truth or reality or a path into themselves that maybe they've never seen but they felt or maybe they felt it in their heritage or maybe they know it's there because it's true um, and all of a sudden they see it on a piece of glass floating in water um, a lot of people can't handle it it really freaks them out and then a lot of people are just totally captivated they just they can't believe because it it has nothing to do with again presentation or with the expectation yeah. there's just an honest reality that when I connect and when the chemistry does its thing, um, it's undeniable. It's it's fascinating when I've when I've looked at those because because of the nature of the process and, they, and as you said they have to sit there for a while they're not able to put on their usual face that they put in front of the camera no. and also because unlike digital you're not it's it's not taken in a fraction of a second where it's just, you know, how that person looked exactly in that second. It's, it's over a period of time. And so there's a, there's a quality of the unpredictable that happens even when you, you know, take the cap off of the lens. And even though you're seeing that person, you really don't know exactly what you're going to get. You're going primarily from a gut feeling because over that duration of time, as you said, there are small changes that, that, that can happen. But when you do see a photograph you said that sometimes you just see it and you know you, you've nailed it and other times it just falls short i know it's hard to maybe quantify because you know photography you're often oftentimes just looking at the aesthetics of the photograph as it well like exposed it's sharp um but for these kind of photographs can you sort of put into words what it is that you either see or feel when you've succeeded when i look at it and i really honestly feel and it has nothing to do with process or the chemistry, but I've, I feel the emotion, I feel the edge, I feel the, the uh, oddity, but the oddity that's honest that I might be able to capture. Um, it's just a feeling for me, and when it works for me, um, you can call it goosebumps on the back of my neck, you can call it uh, quickness of breath, but when I look at it, I know it when, it, when I see it, when I feel it. And in doing that, then when I bring an image and show it to the subject, uh, if they don't like it, it's okay. Um, because I know what it is. I know what I do. And a lot of people, like I mentioned, can't handle it. Um, or it takes them a while. Or it just is a little too shocking. Or the just unexpected nature of the presentation of a piece of glass and, and water that they've never seen it is kind of mind-boggling. And then what it has, the, the visual depth and strange beauty that it can have. It's, it's mesmerizing. It's just plain you know, mesmerizing. You just, it just grabs you. And, and people are they're, they're, they're moved by it. Hmm. So when you shoot now with film or on occasion digital and you're making a, a, a portrait, do you find that you're able to create an image in which you feel maybe not as intensely as you feel when you're doing the collodion, but that somehow you are still able to sort of evoke that, that, that feeling of satisfaction, of joy, of discovery when you're using those other mediums? Oh, absolutely. I'm not a one-trick pony. Uh, I've been at this far too long. Um, I enjoy the process of, of creating. 
of an emotional result. The camera really doesn't make any difference. Um, I've started with Polaroids, plastic cameras, four by five in school, eight by ten. I shoot now with eight by eight square glass and fourteen by fourteen square glass, and I shoot uh, with little digital point and shoots, and I shoot with my iPhone. They all have different purposes. They all have different aesthetics. They all have different personality. And when you deal with them accordingly, instead of trying to make something other than it is, they're all fun. They're all interesting. Right now, I, I shoot a, a daily portrait on my iPhone um, just as a challenge because I'm real busy doing all this other stuff. I've recently shut down a studio and moved, and I'm, I'm really busy, and I can't do the, the collodion probably for another couple of months that I'm going to be up and running. Um, but I need to create. I need to do some. <coughs> so I started shooting a, a series of portraits on a daily basis, just goofing around, but I don't goof around. They mean something. Mm -hmm. They make me laugh. They show different facets of my personality. Sometimes they're honest about what I'm going through. They're always just uh, an extension of who I am as an artist. And if you don't do that on a daily basis, you're missing that little bit of drug that makes you feel good when you get up in the morning and you don't know what you're going to have at the end of the day. But you know by the end of the day you're going to have some semblance of a piece of art that you didn't have before. Yeah. Do you want to be the voice that introduces the show at the beginning of the episode? Send us an audio clip that you can record on your phone, tablet, or computer. Simply say your name, where you're from, and welcome to the Candid Frame. Say it at least twice and give us a few seconds of silence so that we can clean up the audio. Once you're done, email it to info at thecandidframe.com and make sure to include a link to your website or Instagram feed. Help The Candid Frame to continue bringing you great conversations with some of the world's best photographers. You can do this by supporting our Patreon effort by committing as little as $5 or more a month. When you do this, you not only help us to meet the cost of production, but provide us the time and resources we need to bring you conversations you won't hear anywhere else. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Thank you. You have a diverse selection of, of, of people in on your website in terms of the portraits that you've made. And... In, when it comes to choosing the subjects that you are not being commissioned to photograph, but on on your own, are you completely open to just photographing anyone, or do you kind of go with a a, a gut feeling of that someone would be a, the kind of interesting subject that you're you're drawn to behind beyond simply what aesthetically they they look like? That's a very good question and a very important question I'm regarding portraiture. I think a serious portrait shooter eventually needs to understand who their portrait subject is, uh, who their muse is, but their muse can be vast. But it's a type, it's personality, it's energy, it's psychology. A lot, a lot of it for me is, is energy about people. I have a simple philosophy about my portraiture, and that is that interesting people make for interesting portraits. So I try not to shoot boring people. <laughs> and I'm sorry if that sounds rude, but not everybody is intended to be in front of the camera. Or maybe I should rephrase that. Not everybody is intended to be in front of my camera. And when someone is in front of my camera and I do a portrait, I am setting myself up for a lot of work, time-wise, a lot of post-production, uh, hours of time. And it is what I do. It is my art. And I need to have a successful result. Mm -hmm. There's no room for failure for me, even though clothing fails sometimes. You really have to have to work through it. But I do not, to answer your question, I do not shoot everybody <coughs> that asks to be photographed by me. 
um, some commissions I even turned turned down. When I meet someone, and this is hard to explain, and it comes from years and years and years of dealing with people, and even before dealing with people, um, I put myself through art school by attending bar, and I used to watch people. I worked at very busy bars, so you couldn't sit around and talk, but you, you could look while you were working. So I watched people. I learned a lot about people, body language, attitude, energy. That, together with a bit of a psychology background um, back in school, started to make sense about what I felt from people when I met them or when I walk into a room. I know who's possible, possible portrait material for me, and I know who is absolutely not. And that's all I can say is I know it. I know it when I walk in. I can look, I can see, I can feel, and that's just has come from many, many years. Um, and yet, do do I shoot sometimes in situations where I would not normally, or do I have? Yes, I do, and I have to. And therein lies a different challenge. If you're doing that type of a photograph for a commission, for a reason, for uh, advertising, for whatever, okay, you have a goal or you have a purpose that you need to complete. So you do what you need to do to complete that for the people that are paying you to do it, all right? But if it's your fine artwork and for some reason you're put into a situation where you really wouldn't have photographed this person, but they're standing in front of your camera now, you got to do something. And you don't want to just phone it in because, again, it's time and materials. Um, so you want to get something out of it all the time. So what do you do? What is the challenge when the circumstances put someone in front of your camera that is really difficult, is not your quote-unquote portrait subject, you really don't want to shoot, you wouldn't have chosen them to shoot, and I'm talking about the type of people that you shoot for, you know, your... your Maybe fine artwork, and I've had the, I've had the situation, you know, a few times, more than a few times. So how do I deal with it? I am polite. Okay, I will try to solve the situation so that it will work for the eyes of the sitter. All right, so they're going to get something out of it, and they're going to be satisfied. It's still going to take me a lot of work and a lot of time, and I don't have anything out of it. So my challenge before the shoot ends is, then how can I not necessarily always take a, quote, portrait of that person, but then maybe how could I use that person in a different type of a photograph? How can I use it in more of a universal statement? How can I create a little narrative? How can I create a, a little element of theater, a dream? How can I use this person to populate an image or a piece of art for me that works for me that I can put out into the world and is not just a portrait of what this person looks like that I didn't want to shoot in the first place? Yeah. Does that make any sense? No, it does. It makes perfect sense. Okay, I use people. Um, I use myself for my portraits, too. I don't like to shoot myself. I don't like the term self-portraits. It's overused. And I absolutely hate the word selfie. Um, so I shoot portraits. Uh, I'm referring to this, this project I'm working on right now, which is just an iPhone. I'll shoot a portrait every day. But if you look, the one's in the portrait every day. Okay, so it's an auto-portrait, if, if I want to be a little... Well, if I want to not say self-portrait. But anyway, <laughs> you can look, and, and you can learn a lot about me in this little series design, sense of humor, oddity, use of space, reference to my other work, my crazy personality. I'm kind of creative. I know where some things come from, but I know I keep going and I need to fuel it so it's fun to play. So if one looks at that body of work, they're going to learn something about an artist. I'm not just shooting a piece of toast or my tennis shoes or what my puppy looks like, although I sometimes I do shoot what my puppy looks like because I got a great puppy. Well, you know, the words that you just used to describe what the images evoke in you, all really positive elements about you yourself, but you say at the same time that you don't like making pictures of yourself, so... Um well, what's, what's the term for when you, you, know, you point at yourself and you go, hey, you know, isn't this great? Am I good? Yeah. What, what is it? Uh, what, what's the term for that? 
where you're, you're not glorifying yourself or grandiose and yeah, and, and I, I, whatever. Yeah. So I, I, th- I think a lot of people that shoot portraits are, are kind of egomaniacs or they, you know, oh, look at me, look how mm-hmm. beautiful I can be today or look at this. Look. There's very shallow purpose in, in a lot of the self-portraits. Self-obsessed probably. Is yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't want to do that. So the way not to do that is not to shoot yourself um, because it's pretty damn hard to shoot every single day and not fall into some kind of a trap or routine. Or, but again, that is the challenge of it. And if you're an artist, um, you know, the medium doesn't matter and the challenge you accept and you, you have a work ethic that pushes you through it. So um, I'm actually starting to enjoy this this crazy little thing. Um, yeah, and I don't think that... that what you're seeing all these other people do on Instagram is what, what you're doing because th- those people who obsessively take selfies of themselves are putting out an idealized fiction of themselves, of how they would like to be seen. It isn't a reflection of an honest representation of who they are. And so I think that's why you and a lot of us have an aversion to that kind of photography. But I've seen wonderful examples of people who use themselves as subject matter, but who who I feel when I look at their photographs that there's a genuine genuineness to 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 the photographs. No, I agree, and it's not easy to do. So yeah, kudos to those people that can get beyond the obvious uh, pitfalls of doing something like that. But it's the nature of being an artist also is how you solve that kind of a problem. How do you, how do you find not necessarily a voice in everything you do, but how do you satisfy yourself um, in every facet of photography that you might do, every project that you would do, whether it's just a, a quickie little thing just to keep you, you know, your brain from imploding or a long-term project that you work on that, that really matters. It all is important to keep your energy going and to keep your creative process revitalized and to keep you moving forward. And I'm just a firm believer in visual inundation in front of me and, and through me. So and like I said, it's my life. That's what I've done and what I do. For, for the business part of your, your career, how... Did learning about you said you, I guess you had a psychology degree at one point, mm-hmm. or, and 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 your and the skills that you developed in taking pictures of people and being aware of them. How did that help you in terms of dealing with clients? The same sixth sense about dealing with people extends to clients. You and now are you talking uh, client or are you talking the art department or you know, the art directors? They're, they're, art, they're two the, different beasts. All the people who you who you are working yeah. for in any di- different variety of ways where you're creating images not for yourself but right. in the service of others. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I, I tune into people maybe too quickly or I, I get who they are very quickly. So, you know, sometimes people end up working in the art world or the art departments. Uh, they're really struggling. They're not artists or they want to be artists and, and their struggle comes through and, and might affect your work for the job or might taint your work. So you got to be careful how you handle people like that. You might have really difficult client um, that you have to handhold a little bit or you have to be a little softer with. Um, it's it's kind of like being a captain of a ship with uh, advertising with um, clients and art directors etc. Uh, you kind of have to go in a mutual direction. You got to take care of everybody, and you just have to make sure that you're aware that you're all going in the same direction, and hopefully it's a peaceful peaceful voyage. Sometimes people are really difficult. It can be really difficult in commercial situations when there's a lot of money involved and when there's pressure. And people do things that aren't appropriate. They say things that aren't appropriate. And I'm all about energy, and you can kill a room. You know, if you get in an argument or if you say something wrong, um, it can ruin a shoot. It can kill a day. So I'm very aware of people and their presence, and I, I take care of people. Sometimes I have to take care of them much more than I want to take care of them. But I'm interested in the end result. But once they're out the door, okay, that's different than I'm back to who I really am, too. But you have to deal with people on the basis of who they are and how they receive what you do. Um, in a world of commercial photography, I found that there was a, a, quite a bit of education on the behalf of the photographer to the art director to the client as to 
what they wanted versus what the reality of what cameras can do or what you could do, what their expectations were. Um, just all the ingredients that would get you on the same page. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were difficult to get them on the same page. But um, again, therein lies the challenge. You know, commercial photography is is a challenge in its own right. You can make decent money in advertising, um, but they say it steals your soul. Yeah. So you got to be careful. I was talking to a friend of mine who's in an altogether different business, and he just came off a job in a very um, a job where a lot of money was being spent. And um, the client um, was unhappy that one particular thing went wrong that wasn't his responsibility, that the person who hired him, she felt that all these little things went wrong, even though the great majority of things went wrong. And my friend was talking about, because he was the one who initially got the email. We were talking about, you know, when you get people who are sort of complaining about something, they may or may not be reasonable in terms of what the issue is. And sometimes the initial impulse is to do something in order to sort of keep them happy, even if what they're demanding is is not reasonable or uh, is, isn't something that you yourself are completely responsible for. But that sometimes you just have to sort of take a step back and not default to immediate reaction to do something or to surrender something in order to appease them. Up right. to a point. Up to a point. Okay. Right. Up to so, a point. was that a, a, a lesson, a hard earned lesson for you, or? I think that lesson just comes with experience, just in dealing with different people, different situations. I've been fortunate with my commercial photography. I didn't get pegged for a particular genre of photography. I, I shot fashion, advertising, corporate animals, movie posters, portraiture, and environmental stuff, uh, lifestyle. The only things I didn't really pursue were cars and food. And I actually shot a few cars and food projects. So we kind of did a little bit of everything. And that was fun. That was a challenge. I got to the point where I thought, you know, I could shoot anything. I could figure out how to shoot anything, and I could make it look good. Hopefully, I can be creative about it and make it better than just looking good. And like Irving Penn finally said after, I think, about 40 years of work, he said, you know, it's been a long time, but I actually figured out that I kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> so with a little bit of time, you, you, your feet, if you're not totally knocked off your feet, you're standing pretty strong on your feet after years of experience. So I've learned a lot about people and a lot about energy. And I think those two volumes of knowledge have helped me immensely in the very narrowed down focused world that you have to be in, in Collodion. Yeah. You, you've been teaching for a while now. What have you learned about your own process uh, as a result of having to sort of consolidated into a way that you can communicate with with others and instruct them of how to make photographs find their own voice what i've learned about my process of, about teaching is that from the get-go i've always tried to be honest painfully honest i say what i feel about people's work if it's a negative critique or if it's not positive i will give the reasons that I feel it's not working. I don't just say, hey, I don't like it, or it doesn't work. Conversely, if a photograph I think is successful, I'll give you all the reasons that I think is successful. And that's all that I do. I'm just painfully honest. I'm blunt. I'm opinionated. Um, yes, the voice of experience. And as I explain to students, listen to the voice of experience. But it's not gospel. I'm not the photo god. I'm just an, another photographer, maybe a little farther down the line than you are. Maybe I've tasted some of the stuff that you haven't yet. So listen and then make up your own mind. That's the nature of being an artist. You know, you're influenced, you're not influenced. You go one way, you go the other, you know, more power to you. But at least listen, because you're paying a hell of a lot of money to listen to this voice. So there must be a reason. Yeah. There's um. There's a, a tendency for photographers to model themselves after other photographers that they whose work that they like and that they admire. And so part of it's good because they may learn some things. Like if they look at a, a photograph that Dan Winters has created and they've to see, try to figure out how he lit it and 
you know, go through the process themselves. It's, it's a good learning experience. But sometimes f- photographers um, fail to depart from the emulation and, and venturing in directions where their own voice is at the heart of it. And I've experienced this numerous times when I've done the fifth term reviews at Art Center and I'm looking at the portfolios and without exception, I ask, can I see the, your other work? The stuff that's on Instagram or this personal project that's on the side that you're not completely invested in. And almost to a person, that work is always the most interesting and the ones that I want to have more more conversation about. And and there's always sort of a, well, not always, but a good amount of the time, a reluctance to embrace that, likely because they're not seeing seeing that being reflected in the work that's you know outside of their sphere. Why do you think that is? I mean, I have an idea, but I'm really curious uh, for you what that might be. Why the students don't step outside their own? No, why? Why they are creating work that's really interesting, that's very personal, but they're very reluctant to really put that out front and forward. They want to show the work that they've done in class. They want to show oh, the stuff they've done in assignment, okay. which right. is stuff that's more exercises right, right, right. and the personal work, which is really, they, they just go, well, I don't know how I'd make a living from this, blah, blah, and so forth. And they seem very reluctant to really trust themselves to put that work out there. Yeah, one word, insecurity. Hmm. Total. Um, most most artists, well, what, what artist isn't insecure at some point? Um, maybe you've worked your way out of it. But, Everybody has some level, every artist has some level of, can I keep producing? Can I create again? Am I valid? With my students, sometimes I I ask them that if I had a crystal ball on my desk and you could come up and look into it, and in 25 years, you could see that the world was totally indifferent to all of your work in photography, would you continue? Would you pursue it? It's interesting, the answers. Some of them are just right off the bat. Yes, I would. No problem, man. I'm going to do it. You know, they're they're kind of on the way to that mindset. And a lot of others, they look at you with that blank look, man. All of a sudden, gee, that means they don't have the money, they don't have the car, they don't have the house, they don't have the you know, have, oh my God, all the other stuff, and it slams them shut. Hmm. So what do you what do you what are you doing this ride for? Who's it for? And so when you experience those moments of insecurity, we'll get you through it. I believe that I can, sh- I will end up with an interesting piece of work no matter what, or I'll keep working on it. That's a good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And that can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Um, one of my favorite photographers is Keith Carter. Um, do you know Keith Carter's work? Oh, yeah, okay. I, absolutely. Um, Keith understands soul. And Keith is blessed to have a connection unlike any other photographer with the soul of animals, dogs in particular. And he also is fortunate to live in an environment where he can walk out his back door and walk down the road and have an amazing variety of potential subject matter. It's not like walking down to Old Town Pasadena. Although, you can find art in Old Town Pasadena. You know, the old adage, if you can't art, find art in your backyard, you're not going to find it anywhere else. But, how Carter sees and the end result is just plain and simply special. And quite often when I look at his images, they just stay with me. They do not go away. And that's the highest compliment I can give anyone. Yeah. His images are wonderful. And I just love the way he talks. Uh, he also has a wonderful, charming way of words. Um, and he's a very nice man. I've spent uh, many hours talking to him um, about what we do in a process and how mutually lucky we both are. Yeah, I consider myself lucky to have the chance to finally sit down and have a proper, proper talk with you. So thank you, Ken. My pleasure.
Thanks to Ken for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting murfeldphotography.com and murfeldcollodian.com. And to hear and see me talk about my personal photographic process, visit the TCF YouTube channel where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr pool. Check out the TCF Flickr pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My most recent book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. Purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code Pirello40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. If you enjoy the show, help spread the word by writing a review wherever you find and listen to podcasts. And if you write a review on a blog post, let me know and uh, send me a link because I would really like to thank you on air. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Tim Boone, Alan Drexel, and Jeffrey Nistler for their recent contributions. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. And if you scroll down on the app, you'll find a free excerpt from my book that you can download. And we also have an Alexa app. So if you have one of those smart devices, download the skill and listen to the show that way. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.